Municipal Chemical and the Perfect Ratio Playhouse present Merry Christmas, Mr. Cole, a holiday radio murder mystery. Hello, fine listeners, and welcome to the most titillating event of the Yuletide season. Another Christmas audio extravaganza from the people who have brought you such fine entertainment as Specimen 6, The Last Temptation of Bible Boy, and of course, the Tour de Forces, a very Specimen 6 Christmas and Grey Manor. This year's play is Merry Christmas, Mr. Cole, written and directed by Joseph Vogeli, S.R. Lane, and Amy Christine Meline, and starring the voice talents of Joe Sherlock, Ruby Salas, Amy Christine Meline, Stacy Lane, Lacey Best, Michelle Stahl, Layla Rappi, Jonathan Bland, James Ong, Joseph Vogeli, and Rafael Rodriguez. I am your host, Philip Prudhomme, and I present to you an audio play in the grand tradition of old-time radio of the past. Come with us as we peel back the pages of time, back to a remarkably simpler time of 1991. Yes, the year that gave us such fantastic treats as City Slickers, starring the indelible Billy Crystal, grunge music and the fashionable accoutrements of the era, flannel and ripped blue jeans. Ah yes, what a time to be alive. Before we dive into our story this evening, please indulge us with a word from our sponsors. <laughs> oh no, the kids are back already? I still have to fold the laundry, iron Bill's shirts, and take the dog to the groomer. I know they'll be thirsty, but I simply don't have the time to peel and squeeze 13 fresh Florida oranges for a big jug of all natural OJ. Hey ladies, over here at Municipal Chemicals, we know how much you rely on Just Like Home TV dinners and our How to Please Your Mr. Makeup line to keep your home in fine tune working order. Well, now we have something that will really win you the favor of your darling family. When you've been working your feet straight through your high heels to the ground and the kids come barreling through the door, dry as a Sahara, the last thing you want to do is squeeze 13 fresh Florida grown oranges to satiate their thirst. Well, now you don't have to with our new drink, Orange C Plus, created by our cutting edge chemical formulas and loaded with all the vitamins your family needs Orange C Plus cuts down on the hard work of squeezing and grinding all those natural oranges, not to mention the hassle of disposing all of those peels. Who needs the extra work? Orange C Plus is all the flavor of a real orange drink, but none of the hard work associated with the real thing. Orange C Plus is so good, your kids will want it with every meal. Wanda, your meatloaf is drying my mouth out. I need something to drink. <laughs> Try this, Bill. Wow, this is delicious. Gee, the house is clean, Barky looks great. You cooked dinner and you even found time to squeeze 13 oranges for this great juice. How do you do it all? <laughs> oh, I have my secret. <laughs> it's not quite orange juice, but they'll never know the difference. Orange C Plus, now with fluoride, keeping those kiddos' teeth shining white. And now back to the program. Welcome back to the program, dear listeners. Join me now as we drift through the fresh falling snow, wind through and around the city's streets and alleyways until we approach the red brick building that houses the Smith and Cole Detective Agency. Come as I guide you through the front door and up five flights of stairs into the office of John Cole Private Eye. John. 
How are you doing today? Just fine, Philip. Just fine. And yourself? Oh, wonderful. This is my favorite season, after all. Nothing better than sitting by the fire with a cup of cheer telling stories on such a night as this. Say, John, do you mind taking the reins this evening? I heard you have quite the tale to tell, and I'm as much of an ear as my audience. <laughs> well, what do you say? Well, Philip, I suppose I might have a story for you up my sleeve. Something happened to me a couple of years ago about this time of year, Christmas time, that is. Something a bit bizarre, you might say. I remember that day like the back of my hand. I had just pulled an all-nighter, telling a guy whose wife thought he was stepping out on her. He had come home late from work two weeks in a row, and his bride thought she had seen some red lipstick on his collar. It turned out he had picked up a second job as a burger jockey at a cheap diner. The red lipstick was tomato ketchup. Turns out he was hiding the fact that he couldn't keep up with the old ball and chain shopping habits and was trying to earn a little extra dough on the down low to pay off some credit card debt she had racked up. Well, I felt so bad I decided to return the retainer she had given me and now I was going to be late on my bills unless something fell into my lap like real quick. And boy, did something fall on me this time. May as well have been a brick with a boulder tied to it. I was half asleep with my head about to hit the desk when the phone rang. <clears throat> John Cole, Private Eye speaking. John, it's me. Do you have a minute? Well, hey there, Lucy. For you, doll, I'd put a gun against Father Time's temple and take the century. What can I do for you? So what's the skinny on that double feature we talked about? It's a beautiful life and the bells of St. Mary's playing at the cinema. You promised you'd celebrate the holidays with me if I did that thing you liked. So you're going to give me a holiday season to remember or what? Did we set a date for that doll? I seem to remember last time I took you to the pictures, I was left holding the popcorn and you were gone with the wind. You got a hell of a memory, John. A regular circus elephant you are. I'm a busy woman with many fascinating things to do. I can't tie myself to just one fella on any old Thursday. But here we are. It's Wednesday night, and I just got my hair done. And it's two days before Christmas. Listen here, doll. I'd love to take you out tonight, but I'm a little light in my wallet just now. You know what I mean? I'd love to treat you to a nice Christmas dinner and a movie, but... I must have a real big heart for you, Johnny. Okay, we can go Dutch. Does that work for you? Well... Let's just say I'm as light as a feather and I don't even have enough to crack an egg. John, I swear. Good girls don't swear, baby. Oh, if I'm paying, I can be as bad as I want to be. Oh, my. Mr. Cole? Lucy, I gotta call you back. Pencil me in for Sunday. Something's just come up. Sure, sure. When I'm done at church with my mother, am I still paying or what? Maybe not, baby. I'll let you know. Just as I was thinking I was going to be eating shoe leather for a month, one of the prettiest possible paydays walked right into my office. She was about five foot eight, blonde, filled out in all the right places, and wearing my favorite shade of red lipstick. She had the most interesting set of peepers I'd ever seen. One eye was blue and the other was brown. Around her neck was a silver necklace with a crucifix on it. Praise Jesus, I may have just found myself some religion. Um, hello? Is this the Smith and Cole Detective Agency? Are you Mr. Smith or Mr. Cole? Detective John Cole at your service, ma'am. Smith no longer takes up professional residence here. Oh, did he quit? No, he decided to move into a pine box six feet underground four years ago. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It's a rough existence being a detective sometimes. Dickie knew what he was in for. How may I be of service to you? Mr. Cole, I'm in something of a pickle. I'm told you might be the one to help me. Well, call me a pastrami on rye. I just ate. I mean, what can I do for you, dollface? Well, it's my sister, Mr. Cole. She missed her mother's birthday three days ago. Maybe she lost her date book. It just isn't like her. You see, she's usually the first one there and never likes to disappoint mother. I went by her place and knocked, but no one came to the door. I don't have a key, so I couldn't go in to see if she was okay. Sounds like a job for the boys in blue, doll. Did you stop by the precinct first? I tried to report it, but they said she hasn't been gone long enough and probably just took up with some no-good Nick. 
And you're saying your sister isn't the type for falling into bad crowds, huh? Gosh, no. She works as a seamstress five days a week and picks up extra work teaching piano on Saturdays. Sundays, of course, are reserved for the Lord. I'd know if she met a Mr. Wright. Maybe she outgrew those goody two-shoes? I don't like your implication, Mr. Cole. When you've been in this line of work as long as I have, you'll find the simplest answer is usually the right one. When a dame is involved, it's often a fella that's causing the ruckus. I assure you, Mr. Cole, this isn't the case with Marissa. So, what do you want me to do, Miss, uh... Gray. Francine Gray, but you can call me Franny. Okay, Franny. What do you want me to do about it? I want you to find her, Mr. Cole. Go ask some questions, snoop around, see what you can find out. That's what detectives do, right? Well, if you ask my friend Lucy, detectives drink too much scotch and forget birthdays. I have money, Mr. Cole. Well, now you're cooking with gas. It's going to cost you $50 a day plus expenses. All I have in the world is $500. I was saving it to take Mother to see the Pope, but it'll be worth it if you find Marissa, Mr. Cole. Now I'll see what I can do, Miss Gray, but I can't promise you anything of good fortune. Usually when someone walks through my door, they get more than they bargained for, or less than enough to fill up a lemonade glass. Um, okay. I believe in you, Mr. Cole, if that helps. Swell. Okay, then I'm going to need something from you before I get started. Yes, anything. I mean, not anything, if, if what you're asking is, I mean, I, I know how the world turns, but I'm a good Christian girl, and... Nothing like that. I know some guys might be like that around a pretty dame, but not me, Miss Gray. All I need is a couple addresses, your sister's apartment, and the place she works as a seamstress. Oh, and a photo of her, if you've got one. Of course. I wrote down Marissa's apartment number and her work address on this piece of paper. I don't have a photo, but if it helps, Marissa and I are identical twins, so you'll recognize her if you see her. Well, I'll be. Twins, you say? I guess it took God two tries to break that mold. Excuse me? Ah, oh, nothing, doll. You can find your own way out, can't you? Yes, I can. And M Mr. Cole? Yes. Thank you. After I watched the angel with pouty red lips walk out of my office, I decided to visit her sister Marissa's apartment to see what I could find. I clopped my Bostonians over to 3rd and Pradmore, but just as I turned the corner, I noticed two old acquaintances from my days with the police department, Officer Mickey Sully O'Sullivan and Sergeant Theodore Newton. Sully was a dunce with little more than a gerbil motivating the wheel of his mind, but Theo was a good guy. We worked a couple cases together a few years back, why they were walking out of Marissa's building was a troubling question, one I was going to have to get to the bottom of. Hey, uh, look who it is, Sergeant. Hey, Cole, you want the low-down shameless like you doing around these parts? Don't you have some windows that need peeking in, too? Hey there, Sully. I see a lion's been making a dent on your head again. Hey, name's Officer Sully. Uh, I mean, Officer O'Sullivan, who no good punk like you. And where are you getting out with the lion stuff? That tangle of sticks you call a hairdo, that's what I'm talking about, Sully. Hey, why, uh, Sarge, he's making fun of me again. Calm down, Sully. Hey, John, how's it going? Pretty good, and you? How's Emily and the kids? Things are good. Kids are healthy. Wife is happy. Not that the pleasantries are out of the way. What are you doing standing in front of my crime scene? Crime scene? The whole building? No. A couple of the boys are bagging and tagging upstairs, and Sully and I are just about to head back to the precinct. And once again, do you know something about what's going on in this building? Because the chances seem a little high that a private dick like you with your reputation just happens to be approaching this here building at the same time as I'm leaving. Yeah, why do you know, Seamus? I know that your mother's a sweet person, Sully, who must have worked very hard to bring up her eight children. Oh, uh, hey, how dare you speak about my mother? Oh, wait, uh, mm. Thank you? Oh gosh, now I'm confused. Come on, John. Stop teasing Sully and spill the beans. Okay, I was just hired an hour ago to find a missing sister, and this is supposed to be where she resides. And yes, I think that coincidence is very troubling that I would run into you here as well. What apartment is the crime scene in? Please don't tell me it's 205. I'm afraid so. Who did you say lived there? One Marissa Gray, the twin sister of a Franny Gray. 
Huh. She pretty? Nice lips? Brown hair? The sister I met says Marissa is her twin and Franny's a knockout with plush lips, blonde hair, intriguing eyes, different, one brown and one blue. I guess twins can dye their hair to set them apart in a way. Ah, uh, twins, huh? Wow. If she looks anything like that woman upstairs, Sergeant, I... Well, at least her face, that is. Poor thing. Shut up, Sully. Ah, uh, sorry, Sarge. It's just I've never seen anything like it. What does he mean, Ted? You'll have to see for yourself, John. But officially, you ain't actually here. And, and I never officially said nothing to you about this, and officially, you won't see a thing. Whatever it is we are going to see. Thanks, Ted. Hopefully, it is just a coincidence we're both here at the same time, and hopefully for totally different reasons. Yeah, let's hope so. Now, a word from our sponsors. Timmy, are you smoking? Ah, oh, jeez, Mom. Has this ever happened to you? Has your young man wanted so much to be like his big, strong dad that he snuck a smoke from the dresser drawer? Well, now you don't have to worry about Timmy growing up too fast. New from Axton Cigarettes, Axton Junior Candy Cigarettes. Minty taste with a lifelike chalky smoke, just like daddy, but not quite. I know you want to be all grown up, son, but you're just not ready. Here, try one of these. Wow, I can almost taste the tar. Smooth like a real Axton cigarette. Wait till the guys see me. Timmy, are you smoking? <laughs> Don't worry, Dad. I'm still your little guy a little longer with Axton Jr. Oh, Timmy. Axton Jr. cigarettes, not actual cigarettes. Welcome back to the presentation, my salubrious spectators. Last we heard, Detective Cole had hit the beat, so to say, in search for the lovely Miss Franny Gray's sister, Marissa. He had just headed uptown to check out her apartment when he ran across two old police chums with some bad news. There appears to have been a dead body found in the apartment John intended to visit. Could it be Miss Marissa Gray, the beautiful twin sister to Franny? We shall see. John, please continue. I am absolutely riveted in anticipation to find out what happens. Sure, I'd be glad to. Do you mind if I light up one of these mellow beauties first? I'm always better for a story when I'm smoking an Axton cigarette. Well, of course. Like my mother always said, a fine cigarette is the cornerstone of a classy gentleman. Sounds like a smart woman. I've always smoked Axton cigarettes as long as I can remember. They are smooth, mellow, and delicious. Okay, where, well, so where was I? Oh yes, I, I had followed Sully and Sarge up to Marissa's apartment. When we stepped through the door, it reminded me of one of them Jackson Pollock paintings, but all in red, a bloody mess. It reminded me of Nam. Trenches just splattered with blood and bits and parts strewn for miles. Crime scenes are never pretty, but this one looked like a bomb had detonated in the middle of it. Even though I had seen my fair share of horror back in the war, I still had the sudden urge to upchuck what little lunch I had that afternoon. I recognized Nick Mancuso, the coroner, kneeled by the body just about to tag a toe. We had worked together in a few cases back in the day. Hey, Nicky, how you doing? Ah. Uh. Hey, John. I should have figured the bloody of the crime scene was the higher the likelihood of running into you. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's bad luck or just plain rotten luck myself. But it seems to happen nonetheless, and you gotta roll with the punches. Or at the very least, the paychecks. Could you give me a rough guess as to what might have happened here? I wish I could say that it looked like a normal murder, but it does not. And I'm afraid to say what I think it does look like. Let's say you fight that fear and tell me what you're thinking. Well, John, it, uh, it looks like she exploded from the inside out, like nothing I've ever seen before. How about clues? Anything else that might seem... If you're asking for finger or shoe prints, no one was the answer. All trace evidence seems the moment to tie it back to the victim. I'll know more after the autopsy and some forensics, I guess. But I'm betting very little 
will reveal itself. Hey, John. You picking up anything with that special mojo of yours? I'm not sure. Hey, would you look at this? What? It's just a framed photo of family in front of a big house. Sheesh! I thought you were some kind of private dick. Bite me, Sully. A manor house is what it is. That's wealth and class right there. Written down at the bottom left-hand side. See what it says there? Gray Manor, 1973. Look at the lovely little family standing in front of it. Does that little girl look familiar to you? Looks like a younger version of our victim here. What's left, that is. Yeah, but what's missing from the picture? Uh, I don't see no little birdies in the sky. What are you getting at, Seamus? Sully, you dunce. Calm down, John. Sorry, Ted. Look, there's only one girl in that picture. If there were twins, why is there only one posing with mom and pop? And if our gal is just a struggling young thing in the big city, why does that photo seem like she came from the lifestyles of the rich and famous? Something doesn't add up. I'll see you boys later. Where are you going, John? I gotta see a gorgeous blonde about this gray manor house. I had a funny feeling after visiting the apartment of the exploded sister that I needed to ask that beautiful dame with the plush lips a few more questions before I dug deeper into her case. Also, I knew someone needed to deliver the bad news about her sister. It was either myself or Sully, and I couldn't trust Sully to so much as tie his shoes and to convey the brutal news of the death of a loved one. Halfway back to the office, I realized the only two addresses Franny had given me were for Marissa's apartment and Marissa's work at the factory. I had no way of contacting Franny, so I decided to try out the factory that Marissa worked at. I had hoped to get more answers when I arrived there, but after talking to the foreman that ran the place, I left with more questions than when I showed up. The foreman, one Mr. Bruno, informed me that yes, Marissa had indeed worked there at one point, but it was nearly a year before that and only for a short while. As I headed out the door, a lovely lady with a quaint disposition grabbed my arm and pulled me aside. Mr. Cole, I heard you were looking for Marissa. Not exactly, dear. I know where she is, unfortunately. She's resting peacefully at the city morgue by now. Oh my god! I'm sorry, honey. I didn't mean to upset you. I have a rough way when it comes to feelings and whatnot. I'm here to find out anything about Marissa that I can. I was hired by her sister. She had a sister? I had no idea. Did you know Marissa well? Well, not really, but she seemed very nice. She worked here for about three weeks, talked on her breaks a little. She never let on about her past too much, but um, yeah, she did tell me she was from upstate. Polingville County, I think she said. Polingville, huh? Anything else she said that stuck with you? No, I'm sorry. That's all I know. I hope it helps. It just might. Thanks for the help. You're welcome, Mr. Cole. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Marlene. After my conversation with Marissa's former coworker, I decided a trip to the country had just been added to my deck of cards. But before I could scoot out of town, I had to tie up one loose end with Lucy. About time you called me. My hair is done and set. When you coming to get me already? Well, about that doll, how can I say it? It ain't in the stars tonight for us. You gotta be kidding me. I got tons of studs sniffing around my door. You're just one dime in my dozen. You mangy, samish son of a- Now hang on a minute, doll. Don't you give me any guff. I'm working on a real case here that's a head scratcher and I gotta see it through to pay the bills. You like nice things, don't you? Well, I gotta find out about this other dame to pay the piper or I can't take you out. Hello, Mr. Cole. Have you found my sister? Franny, I was hoping I'd see you again soon. Who are you talking to? I've had just about enough of your carrots and sticks. I'm nobody's maybe, and another thing. I gotta go, Lucy. Trouble's just landed in my lap. Franny, I have some sad news for you. Please sit down. I'd rather stand for sad news, thanks. Tell me now, did you find Marissa? I went to her apartment and the cops had beat me there. They had already taken her out in a body bag. Nothing much left. The only clue is one photograph. Do you know anyone that would want her dead? (gasps) Dead? What? How? No, she can't be. It isn't time yet. You've got to be mistaken. Whoa there, you're swaying. Please, sit down. I don't want another corpse on my watch tonight. 
There you go. Take a deep breath. You want a drink? I need a drink. Scotch okay? Sure, fine. Thanks. Here, doll face. Drink it slow. It burns. Thank you. Take it easy there. That's premium single malt. Hey, what's that mark on your wrist? Tattoo? It looks almost like a rune symbol. You German? What? Oh, <laughs> that's nothing. A crazy drunken night in college. I think it means courage. Hmm. Looks like the type of thing the SS was fond of. Can I take a look at it? Mr. Cole, stop stalling and tell me what happened to my sister. Well, it's like I said, I got there when they were already wheeling her out, or what was left of her, that is. I hate to turn your stomach, but it wasn't a pretty sight. I need more to go on if I'm going to find out who took her out. I checked with the foreman at the factory, and he said she hasn't been in for quite a while. Do you know anywhere else she might have worked? Huh. She skipped out on the factory. She was supposed to... This isn't good. Mr. Cole, I really must be going. Time is I'm running out. Calibration must be off. I'll send you a check for what I owe you. Wait, I've barely scratched the surface here. What do you mean time is running out? Do you know something about all this you're not telling me? Like, why weren't you in this photograph with your sister at Gray Manor? That's a dead end. Don't go there, Mr. Cole. Only ghosts and remnants live there now. I really must be going. Now, wait a minute. I have to track any lead I can get. All I have right now is this photo of your family standing on your estate. And you say I can't go there? I have to go. Time is of the essence. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cole. Well, that was a bum's rush. Seems like she knows more than she lets on. Ignoring Franny's dismissal, I drove to Gray Manor to investigate further. I had the strange gnawing feeling in the pit of my gut that a clue was buried somewhere under that old dark house. I could hardly believe this was the same place from the photograph. It looked like no one had lived there for years, and a crawling infectious disease had dug its sickening tendrils into what was once a place of high prestige. I parked the car and moseyed up to the door. I banged on the large iron knockers that looked like gargoyles with long tongues flickering in the air. Everything about this place screamed bad news, but I needed to know if Franny was safe. I banged once, no answer. Banged again, harder. The door creaked open and a high-pitched voice called out to me. Good evening, sir. How may we help you? Who is that? I looked down and there was a gaunt, creepy little man in a suit and tie. Oh, hey there, little fella. I didn't notice you there. I'm looking for a Franny Gray or possibly anyone else in the family. Is there a Mr. or Mrs. Gray here? Uh, no, you must be mistaken. No one who lives here goes by that name. Maybe, maybe not. How about you let me in and I see for myself? <coughs> well, well, would you look at this place? Pretty fancy. Now listen to me, you big palooka. You have no business coming in here. I am Kilgrave, the family servant, and I will make you pay. Am I understood? Out of my way, shorty. How dare you push me? Kilgrave, calm down and welcome the gentleman into our home with a bit more hospitality. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. I looked up and saw the beautiful angel that started this whole mess. She was looking as good as ever, dressed in a long red evening gown with glistening crimson lipstick. If I was a lesser man, I would have buckled at the knees at how fine she looked just then. Hello there, Franny. How are you doing? Franny? Oh, you must have mistaken me for my sister, Francine. I'm sorry, uh, Mr... Cole. John Cole. Private detective. Private detective. Hmm. Yes, it does seem like something my sister would get herself into. No, Mr. Cole, my name is Marissa Gray. Dr. Marissa Gray. Marissa, but you're, you're dead. I assure you, Mr. Cole, I am very much alive. Franny did tell me about our sister, though. Her name wasn't Marissa. Poor, misguided Georgina. What an unfortunate tragedy that befell her. Now, what's going on here? Franny never mentioned a third sister. Through a side door walked who I presumed to be Franny at this point, but I was having a difficult time keeping up as things became stranger and stranger. I'm sorry I misled you, John. I just wanted to talk some sense into our other sister before, well, before what you saw happened to her. You, you killed her? Oh, heavens no, she exploded on her own. It was her fault, really. If she had stayed with us, she would have received the proper treatment. What the hell is going on here? You shall find out very shortly, John. Kilgraves, please take Mr. Cole into the laboratory. Yes, yes madam. What the hell? What, what the hell are those? As if things hadn't taken an odd enough turn in the case, what with the three sisters now suddenly, I was confronted with two dozen identical three-foot butlers, 
all looking hungry for my blood. I tried to run, but they all jumped on me, clawing and biting and kicking. Never had I seen so many tiny fists flying so fast in the air. Next thing I knew, there was nothing but darkness. I had been knocked unconscious. Now a word from our sponsors. Hi, Nancy. Come on in. How's Bob doing? Oh, you know, same old Bob. Out with the boys again. Drinking and playing poker, I think. Oh, I hate it when they come home smelling like cigars. I know, right? Of course, it's not so bad after they head to the lake. I don't mind the smell of a good trout. Ooh, you can say that again. It smells so delicious in here. I caught the scent from a block away. You mean this? Oh my, it looks absolutely scrumptious. Mmm, Barbara, this is the most delicious muffin I've ever chomped into. It's absolutely mouth-watering. Mmm, I know, right? Isn't it yummy? Mm, I just can't seem to fill my mouth with enough of it. You must give me the recipe. Is there a special ingredient I need to know about? It's so juicy and moist. Why, it's Sally's Fluffy Muffin Mix. Sally's Fluffy Muffin? Yeah, Sally's Fluffy Muffin Mix. <gasps> Where do I get it? I can't stop licking my lips. I must have some more. It's easy. Just go down to your local grocer and follow your nose to the baking aisle. You know, where they keep the yeast. Mm. They're right next to aisle six, where they keep Dan's egg noodles. But who wants a limp noodle when you can have Sally's Fluffy Muffin? Mm. Mm. Oh, so good. Oh, I know. Oh, I don't think I've ever been so satisfied. I'm going out to buy some right now. We should try each other's muffins next week. Sounds delightful. Sally's Fluffy Muffin Mix, a perfect treat when your husband's away. Mmm, you can say that again. All right then, Sally's Fluffy Muffin Mix, a perfect treat when your husband's away. Mmm, mm, so I delicious. In my mouth. Mm. Mm. And now, to conclude Perfect Ratio Theater's production of Merry Christmas, Mr. Cole. John, wake up. John. I felt someone brushing my brow with a spongy wet cloth. My mouth tasted like pennies and I realized it was my own blood. I opened my eyes to see a hand dabbing my head. I reached up to swat the hand away. There was a stench in the darkened room that made me want to chuck the banana sundae I had on the way over. I think he needs medical attention, Marissa. Nonsense, Brandon. He's, He's fine. fine. I suddenly felt another hand prodding my Johnson. Hey, cut that out. I like his soft thing thing. I want it. Can I have a soft thing thing to play with? Nine, Marissa, ten. Marissa, one wants him at one piece for the big operation. For goodness sakes, Marissa, four, you're scaring him. We have to keep his heart rate down. Kilgrave, bring up the lights. Yes, yes madam. madam. A soft glow from an overhead operating lamp above my head illuminated just enough detail to fill my mind with terror. Many hands attached to bizarre shadowy figures were feeling different parts of my body. One was injecting my arm with an IV, while another was giving me an oddly arousing foot massage. I turned my head, and on the slab next to me was an older man who looked like he'd been thawed that morning. He was blue and motionless. The figure was long on the table, probably six foot five standing up. Hoses and wires protruded from his mouth and parts of his torso. I squinted my eyes and hoped I was not seeing what I believed I was seeing. Suddenly the room became illuminated. I couldn't help myself but scream in bloody terror. Ah! Next to me, below me, and above me lingered several deformed versions of Franny, Marissa, whoever it was that was responsible for all this. One of the macabre figures was a head in a jar attached to a mechanical arachnid body. The one feeling up my manhood was a figure that resembled a melted ice cream cone plopped on a hot sidewalk, wearing a Bart Simpson shirt that said, eat my shorts. Its hand, similar to a tentacle, tugged at my little bishop in a funny hat. The delicate fingers prancing across my jawbone 
were attached to nothing other than a sweet pair of lips on a lumpy ball of flesh with pretty blue and brown eyes. I had no idea what nightmare world I had awakened into. I like his thing thing. I want his thing thing. I like his thing thing. I want his thing thing. Calm down, Mr. Cole. You are in my expert hands now, and I do not mean to have any harm come to your body. My sisters are merely preparing you for the surgery. Surgery? What are you doing to me? It's, it's almost, almost time, time, madam. Thank you, Kilgraves. Here, take this beanie baby and give it to Marissa Ten. She will need something soft to pet instead of Mr. Cole's member. I now, Mr. Thing, Cole, I'd like something. to introduce you to my dear papa, George Gray. You are absolutely vital to bringing him back to his former glory. His brilliance was cut short during his prime, during a terrible event a few years ago. He has been in cryogenic stasis ever since. Now you will give him the chance to finish what he started during the war. The war? Listen, honey, I saw a lot of strange things in Nam, but nothing like this. Oh no, Mr. Cole. My father uh, was the uh, Third Reich's greatest uh, mind of uh, science. Uh, your father was a Nazi? Now I've heard it all. You will obey the madam or there will be consequences, Mr. Cole. Are we understood? Get off me, you little freaks. Franny, what's going on here? What happened to your sister? At least answer me that. It is okay, Franny. Allow Mr. Cole this one kindness before he gives his body to the future of mankind. Our sister, Mr. Cole, was a clone. Just like I am. Just like all our other sisters you've met tonight. In total, there have been 33 of us. Georgina was our 26th sister. I am the 27th. But we all go by our creator's name, Marissa, when we travel amongst society. The others are infiltrating mankind as we speak, traveling the world, learning, experimenting, and fulfilling our family's destiny. I hired you to find Georgina so that I might convince her to come home to us. I'm sorry I had to deceive you. Humanity would not understand what Marissa has accomplished just yet. Marissa has been creating more sisters, clones, to multiply her brilliance. The only snag was a slight aberration in our genetic coding that caused some of us to implode. A missing ingredient, if you will, that we've only recently discovered. Georgina was slightly different from the rest of us. I don't know why. She was adjacent to us, somehow baked in the oven a little too long. She wanted to live her best life before the Big Bang happened. Unfortunately, she would have been just fine had she enjoyed the company of her sisters a little while longer. Marissa figured out what was wrong with the recipe. That is all you shall be allowed to understand. As for your body, well, our father needs some fresh parts to live out his destiny. I tried to struggle free, but it was no use. The twins from Nightmare on Elm Street had me locked down tight, and the little creepy dudes had scalpels close to my more sensitive areas. I tried to buy a little more time. And what about these little guys? What's their story? Kilgraves are clones as well. They are Marissa's first success in the field. The original Kilgrave was the family's manservant for decades, but like our father, his life was ended during the tragic incident that occurred here at Gray Manor. Unlike us, Marissa was only able to grow Kilgraves up to three feet tall. Obviously, except for my sisters with their slight malformations, you can see that we've perfected the science as far as the rest of us go. Franny, that's enough. Kilgraves, begin the transfusion. Yes, 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 yes madam. madam. This is insanity. One person's insanity is another's giant leap for mankind. My father was one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. Your sacrifice here will propel human beings into the next step of their evolution. Franny, please tell her, you know this ain't right. You've known all along. Why else would you come looking to me for help? You're serving a higher purpose. You're merely a means to an end. I needed to locate Georgina without drawing attention to the rest of us. Madam, everything is ready for the transfusion. Very good, Kilgraves. Uh, Franny, uh, hand me my scalpel. Uh, Hold still, uh, Mr. Cole. Uh, 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 so there I was, within inches of losing my life, hooked up to bells and whistles and getting rubbed up and down by bodacious monstrosities with some old Nazi about to invade my personal space permanently. I heard a voice that once upon a time would grate my senses like nails on a chalkboard, but now seemed like manna from heaven. Uh, hey, Sarge. I thought I heard something down this way. Kilgraves, begin the sequence now. I hear it, Sully. Draw your gun. 
We don't know what kind of wackos we're dealing with. Madam, the alarm has been tripped. We are being infiltrated. I've worked too long and hard for this. I will not be stopped when we're so close. Activate the kill graves. We, we are, are here, here to do your bidding, bidding Madame Marissa. We, we are, are here, here to do your bidding, bidding Madame Marissa. Bar the door and take out anyone who tries to interfere with our mission. Ugh. What the hell? Uh, what is this? Some kind of, uh, munchkin convention? Get the little buggers off me! They're biting me! Watch where you're shooting, Sully! That one nearly nicked my hardware! Uh, sorry, Sarge. Holy mackerel! Is that you, John? Boy, is it good to see you two. How did you know I was here? We investigated that girl and her family from the photo, and discovered they were tied to some pretty grisly things back in the big one. Knowing you, John, I figured you'd wind up here in a heap of trouble, so we decided to follow your lead. Sisters, protect Father's body. We must bring him back. Sully, go get John. I'll take care of these dirty little Oopa Loopas. You get those freaky bimbos off John. Sully charged forward as Sarge struggles to take out the little Kilgraves. Popping rounds into the tiny bodies, they were like squirrels on a salty nut. Ah, uh, what the hell is that? Looks like some kind of giant metal spider with a lady's face. I will tear you apart, little man. Just as Sully was approaching my side, Marissa 47 lunged forward from the shadows, piercing Sully through the chest with one of her metal talons. He fell to the ground like a sack of potatoes. As he fell, his body crashed onto the control panel near the frozen Nazi, deactivating the energized clamps that had been holding me down. Now free, I grabbed a nearby blunt medical instrument and smacked the glob of flesh version of Marissa away from my face. Ah! Next, I jumped from the table and kicked the melted ice cream cone in the belly, knocking molester Marissa into a boiling vat of steaming green chemicals as she fought to swim her flesh boiled off. It was then I reached for Sully's gun from his lifeless hand. I aimed it at Franny. John, stop! You're ruining everything! Please, you don't know what you're doing. We're creating something for all of humanity here. We are doing great work. Please, John, if you ever cared for me, stop killing my sisters. I don't have time for this. Father has waited long enough. Mr. Cole, get back on the table. The original Marissa was now pointing a loaded tranquilizer gun at Sarge. Knowing he was my only hope out of here, I lunged at her, hoping to knock her over. Just then, Franny threw herself in front of her sister. Our bodies hit hard, like a linebacker knocking out the quarterback. Franny hit her head on the operating table and went down, blood pooling around her. Another one bit the dust. Such a shame. That one really had something special about her. Ugh, she got me. A freaking trank gun of all things. John, don't let the little bastards do experiments on me. So there I was, squared off against the original Marissa and the few remaining miniature Kilgraves. With Sully's gun burning in my hand, I had a clear shot at the psycho with the trank gun. Just as she was about to either trank me like a baby elephant or unleash the sick little puppies on me, I aimed my gun coldly at the frozen corpse's temple lying on the table. Freeze, or I'll shoot the Nazi. No! Okay, Mr. Cole, please. Whatever you do, don't shoot my father. I need his brain intact if I'm going to transmit his brilliance into a worthy vessel. Obviously, I made a miscalculation with you. You are clearly not a suitable donor for his greatness. I could have told you that, doll face. Now put yours down, and I'll put mine down. That's it. Now back away real slow. You idiot! What have you done? You killed my father and all my Kilgraves! Of course I did, baby. You didn't think I'd let some Nazi scum come back to life, or let you get off so easily. Now, I'm gonna put these handcuffs on you, so no more surprises. Just as I was about to put on her cuffs, her knees buckled, and she slumped into my arms. Not sure what had transpired, I looked back over my shoulder and saw Sarge with a smoking gun barrel in his hand. I looked back to the psycho with an angel face in my arms and turned her over. She had a bullet hole in her forehead. Sarge! I had her! I was gonna take her into custody! It's better this way, John. Our system is too creaky to hold someone like that. I've seen it before during the war. You take someone like that in prison walls, and the next thing you know, some man in black shows up and flashes a badge. They take her with them, and a few years later, something really bad happens. And somehow, she's whispered to be connected to it. What are you talking about? Don't worry about it, John. 
Just leave here, and I'll call in backup. I'll say Sully and I showed up here on a hunch, and things went south. Sully bravely lost his life in the line of duty, his family will get his checks, and they'll bump me up to a desk job. I won't mention your name at all. Ted, I... Th there's more of her. Twenty-five or more. God knows how many. Clones and all that weird stuff. Then if we find them, we kill them. Every one of them. Merry Christmas, John. Now get the hell out of here. So, I left. I had no idea what else to do. The madness I had somehow become convoluted with had smashed my senses like a wrecking ball and left me lost in a void of confusion. I knew I had to go see someone that was unattached to all this. Someone that was funny, kind, beautiful, and had no idea what kind of real evil was in this world. John! What are you doing here so late? Why, I should be right sore at you. What if I was busy with a... And so forward? You haven't even bought me dinner and you think you can kiss me like that? Shut up and hold me, baby. John! Oh, John, honey, what's wrong? Could you do something for me? Oh, John, what is it? Spend Christmas with me, would you? Of course, John. Of course. Well, would you look at that? Hey there, doll face. John, I told you, when you're married to a gal you call a honey, your sweetie, your dearest, not doll face. Who's this? Oh, well, this is my good friend, Philip. We were just talking about Christmas and how much the holidays mean to us. Is that right? Well, good timing, because we have a little singing practice we need to work on for Sunday service. Practice? Sunday service? <laughs> John, you big knucklehead. We promised my mother we'd join the Christmas choir and sing Silent Night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Philip, how about we get our audience to sing Silent Night with us? Let's really send them off with some Yuletide spirit. Well, sure. All right, everybody. Let's do this. Silent Night. Holy, holy, holy night. night. Holy, holy night. Holy Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant so Good night, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Until next year, from our house to yours, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.